Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Janice Kamener Resnick, and on behalf of Jews United for Democracy and Justice and Community Advocates, I warmly welcome you to our 68th consecutive week of American at a, America at a Crossroads virtual town halls. Tonight's program features the extraordinary American Alex Vindman in conversation with Pat Morrison. Our judge leadership team includes Mel Levine, David Lehrer, Zev Yaroslavsky, Caroline Kelly, and Rabbi Ken Chazen. You saw our list of co-sponsors on the screen a moment ago, and we are grateful to all of you. We have some great programs coming up. Next week, we welcome a very dynamic duo. Shira Frankel, who covers cyber issues for the New York Times and who wrote An Ugly Truth Inside Facebook's Battle for Domination. In addition to Shira, UCLA constitutional law professor Eugene Volokh will, will be joining us. They will be exploring social media and its impact on American politics, as well as the legality of imposing controls or restrictions on the content posted. They will be in conversation with Larry Mantle. Tomorrow is August 12th. As I said to this audience last year on this date, on August 12, 1952, Joseph Stalin ordered the execution of 13 of the greatest remaining Jewish writers, thinkers, and poets, having falsely accused them of treason. They were murdered on August 12th in the cells of Moscow's Lubyanka prison. The murder of this remnant of Jewish cultural heroes was particularly devastating as it occurred only a few years after Hitler. For those who were involved in the Soviet Jewry movement, August 12th became known as the Night of the Murdered Poets. The Night of the Murdered Poets is known by a diminishing number of people in the world. So I make a special effort to note the day each year and to remind myself and others with whom I connect of the evils of racism and totalitarianism and the dangers of lawlessness and the lack of accountability. Tonight's speaker, Alex Vindman, and next week's speaker, Eugene Volokh, both Soviet Jews, whose families escaped the Soviet Union, can give direct testimony about how their families risked their well-being and safety to leave the Soviet Union, yearning to live in a democratic country where they believed justice and accountability would prevail. Tonight, we celebrate the idealism and heroism of Alex Vindman, who took tremendous risks to do the right thing as a very high-ranking member of our United States government. And we also memorialize those who were killed 69 years ago on the night of the murdered poets due to government sponsored racism, hate, and the lack of accountability. Now my colleague and friend, David Lehrer will tell you about a couple more programs coming up. David. Thank you, Janison, for that very important message. Tonight we get to hear from a real life superhero, a person whose actions are what the New York Times described in a review of his book, Here Right Now, Matters in the American Story, just which just came out last week and will be number two on the New York Times bestseller list this week. And as those of an ordinary man placed in extraordinary circumstances who did the right thing. Janice and I had the opportunity to have an in-person lunch with our guest, Alex the, the Alexander Vindman, this week. He is as forthright, intelligent, and pleasant in the flesh as he seemed when he spoke to a rap nation from Washington, D.C. in November 2019. We have several other programs that we want to don't we don't want you to miss in addition to the ones that Janice mentioned with the top rung of Washington DC's journalists. On September 1st we'll be joined by Warren Olney with Michael Bender, the Wall Street Journal's senior White House correspondent and author of the recently released New York Times bestseller Frankly, we did win this election. Bender chronicles the White House's machinations during Trump's final months in office. His work has been described as the best of the books analyzing Trump's decline. Following Bender will host David Frum. Frum is one of the most incisive and analytical of the pundits and columnists writing today. His works Trumpocalypse and Trumpocracy offered prescient insights into what ailed America for four years. He'll be in dialogue with Madeleine Brand. And this week we've added one of our most popular prior guests, the Washington Post, Jennifer Rubin, who'll be discussing our upcoming book, Resistance, How Women Save Democracy from Donald Trump. And now to introduce this evening's guest, a winner of Pulitzers, that's with an S, Emmys with an S, and Golden Mics with an S, for her work in print at the Los Angeles Times, for radio on NPR, and for TV on PBS, Pat Morrison. Pat? David, thank you. Janice, thank you, too. What you just described, David, really sums up American literature and American movies, an ordinary man in extraordinary circumstances, except this really happened. 
we had four years packed with political drama, but a few moments will still stand out. And among them was that day on November 19, 2019, when Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman testified before Congress about a phone call between President Donald Trump and Ukraine's new President Zelensky. It turned into, to use a crude term, a corrupt shakedown for a favor from Ukraine to stage a bogus investigation to try to take down Trump's likely rival in the 2020 election, Joe Biden. What unfurled from there wasn't what Vindman expected, it wasn't what the nation expected, and yet it helped to change the course of our nation's story as well as its tone. Alex Vindman received a number of honors and commendations for his 21 years in service, and of course the Purple Heart when he was wounded in Iraq. That service taught him judgment, calculated risk-taking, timing, analysis, strategic and tactical thinking and planning, and that yet still no one could have foreseen or planned for what happened to him. As he writes about a job on behalf of the long range security interests of the United States that would collide with President Trump's short term nickel and dime electoral and political sleaze. The title of his book is taken from his testimony. It is here, Right Matters, an American story, as you heard, now number two on the best seller list at the New York Times. So thank you. I can call you Alex, and I appreciate that. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. <clears throat> Thank you for that terrific warm welcome, uh, David and, and Janice, for your your support and um, endurance listening to me talk multiple times this week. And I'm looking forward to this conversation, Pat. Thank you. As a young man, you decided to serve your country and you spent 21 years in the military doing that. But unexpectedly, you came to serve your country in a very different way that you wouldn't have expected no one would have expected, but I think we would all agree that it was a public service. Can you characterize what you think that public service ended up being and doing? For me, fundamentally, it was living up to my oath of, of office, an oath that I had sworn on multiple occasions, uh, an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign or domestic. <clears throat> I, um, in, in certain ways, I'm pretty fortunate to be able to pinpoint the moment where I, I know I made a marked contribution to our national security and our national defense. Over a 21 year career, there have been many moments where I, I thought I'd made an impact. I had authored kind of the definitive document to defend this country against the threat posed by Russia. I had led countless meetings synchronizing all sorts of activities by the US government. And um, in this moment though, I saw our, our nation uh, at risk and a president attempting to steal the election by uh, you know, tipping the scales in his favor, by calling for a foreign power to investigate the United States, uh, to investigate uh, his rival in upcoming election. And uh, I just did my duty. You know, President Trump was still in the White House residence for that call in July 2019 with President Zelensky. So I can imagine you sitting there on the phone and looking at the phone and doing this kind of cartoon this, did I really hear what I thought I heard, what the president said to President Zelensky about the quid pro quo that, that he was demanding? Yeah, it wasn't, <clears throat> excuse me, it, it wasn't, um a revelation about what was going on. Frankly, I watched this, this enterprise, this corrupt enterprise unfold over the course of many months, Ambassador Ivanovich being removed uh, by you know, the, the machinations of Rudolf Giuliani and corrupt uh, Ukrainian actors, um, ultimately being removed when Donald Trump Jr. Um, tweeted about her. And then all these pronouncements about investigations into the Bidens. What was the major revelation, frankly, was the president's own direct involvement. Uh, up until that point, uh, my reverence for, uh, for the office of the president kind of maybe uh, clouded the, the view that the president himself was the driving force. Up until that point, uh, I, had, I knew that there were all sorts of co uh, corrupt individuals and kind of people looking to ingratiate themselves with the president. But it was that phone call, the president's demand for Zelensky to investigate uh, the Bidens in exchange for a White House meeting and security assistance. That that was that kind of crystallized where where this uh, 
started and ended. It started with the president's enterprise in a, an abuse of power. And uh, I just didn't feel, I mean, I knew uh, in, my, in my heart that uh, nobody was above the law. And uh, I was going to report the president to the proper authorities in proper channels behind closed doors with the, the, the you know, belief that things would, we could get reconciled. And that was, to me, one of the core elements of your story is that you were taught throughout your military career to rely on the chain of command. You believed it to be your duty to report misconduct, even if it was on the part of the president. You said, and then I expect of the appropriate professionals to sort things out and correct a situation that was disastrous for the country and potentially the globe. You thought the process was self-rectifying. You thought the chain of command would take care of this. Why didn't it? Well, you know, it's, uh, it, that's an excellent question. I think par in part, it's because um, this under uh, different administrations, the folks that would be serving in those offices would be high, highly honorable, highly competent individuals. In this <clears throat> administration, the president set the tone and the character of the, of the, the administration and the people that filled its ranks. And he basically selected people that were of his ilk. And, uh, you know, I guess my faith in the system was in part due to, to my um, service in the military in an apolitical organization with really little interaction with the political class up until that point. And uh, I had, I, you know, I believed that these people were going to do the right thing. In fact, even John Eisenberg, I had a, a pretty uh, positive appraisal of him because I remember on let, my first, let, me ad, let me identify him. He's the senior attorney for the National Security Council. Right. Former Department of Justice, uh, senior, uh, uh, former Department of Justice official. I remember uh, sitting on a plane, uh, one of those kind of distinct, um, this uh, VIP flight from, uh, we were flying from Geneva after, um, after we set up a meeting between uh, Bolton, Ambassador Bolton, the National Security Advisor, and his Russian counterpart, Nikolai Petrushev. And then we were flying to uh, I think we, this was on, en route to Kiev, or it could have been back on the back end. Anyway, we, we were sitting next to each other, and I had a conversation about his, uh, and what he revealed to me is that he wanted to serve. He had prospered uh, both as kind of a, a, you know, an attorney in the private sector, uh, made a lot of money, and this is, was his idea to give back. And I took people at their word. It turned out that, you know, uh, in this case, uh, that, was, that was misplaced. But I always start with a point of like, you know, taking people at their word, giving people the benefit of the doubt until they, they, they tell me otherwise. That's not the case always. So I'm not that naive. Uh, but in this case, I, I you know, expected senior officials to do their job and live up to their oath. And as you gradually learned, they weren't doing it. As you said that Eisenberg would occasionally check with you to quote, make sure you didn't go off the reservation. And then you were told not to talk to anybody else about the phone call. So it seems like more and more people began to realize the implications of this phone call and were afraid of it. It was a hot potato. It was a hot potato, but I think at that point, uh, frankly, uh, you know, this dispels this notion of, of the government ever being able to orchestrate any kind of conspiracy because you tell like two people in Washington and you're telling the world or something of that nature. But at this point, you know, their, their, their desire to do some crisis management and contain this had already uh, exceeded their ability to do so because at that point there was a whistleblower uh, complaint that was uh, um, that was that was reverberating through the halls of the CIA and the Office of De Defense, uh, uh, you know, and, and ODNI ultimately, and um, it was it was starting to it eventually would come to the attention of um, Congress with its oversight responsibilities in the House, um, so. I think in part they were looking to manage me and to you know keep me on sides as as it were and uh, to you know somehow downplay my my deep concerns that they that anybody that kind of made an honest appraisal when I offered my when I reported this to to John Eisenberg and Michael Ellis knew exactly where I stood but they were trying to you know I guess minimize the damage and um, under the impression that you know eventually this might break into the public sphere. And it was a paradox to me, and I'm sure this has struck you several times, that the whistleblower from the CIA was never publicly confirmed and, and identified, and that in fact some of your superiors put the, the pressure on you thinking that you in fact were the whistleblower. 
Yeah, so um, this is something that I've thought about uh, on many occasions. I do, I do believe that I was the, you know, I, I was the, the official that reported this and maybe in, in certain cases kind of the, the, the absent my report, this would have never been disclosed or uncovered. But there, I, I can't take credit for the impeachment of the, of, of the, the president because, yes, I made my complaint, but then there was somebody else that also felt de this was deeply wrong and reported it through other channels. And then, you know, my, my prominence, I guess, came about not necessarily even because I was a, the, 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 the reporting official in the White House, but because I testified and I was the uh, official that was on the call and uh, appeared in uniform in front of Congress and provided factual testimony on the president's um, abuse of power. And yet, the, because the whistleblower was never known, uh, at least publicly, the, the whistleblower did get threats and, and attention, but kind of below the level where you got the most public of scrutiny and the most public of threats. Uh, uh, that's true, but that's also uh, in complete um, consistency with the way this this uh, last White House operated under Donald Trump. It was, a, it was um, you know, they were looking in my case as they were and anybody that was um, that they saw as a threat or um, you know not politically or reliable they would attack uh, not facts but attempt character assassinations to deflect and you know raise process concerns um, because they couldn't stand on on the facts the facts kind of spoke for themselves and and one thing that where you saw that the penny dropped in your own mind was when the transcript of this phone call was put into a secret server. And when you saw the cleaned up, the tidied up transcript of the conversation, it had been take all of the references to, to uh, Burisma and to Biden had been taken out and you put them back in by hand and they were taken out again. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so I don't know if it was, if it unfolded quite that cleanly. Uh, what you don't have is you don't have a recorded transcript after uh, Watergate, I think uh, we, you know uh, there was a point made to not record uh, these these call, uh, these calls involving the president, but there is a high fidelity transcript that's developed based on whatever you know means they they do behind the scenes with the communications folks, and then what ends up happening is that it comes back to people like me, the directors, the people that organize the call that you know basically manage the relationship, and I'm supposed to make sure that it, it's consistent with what I heard, and that's why I was taking copious notes. Uh, to make sure I had a kind of a, a kept track of all the, the points and the, the transcript I received didn't include some some really important substantive materials I included them and when it went back into the system they didn't make it for whatever reason I don't know if that was nefarious or malicious uh, they just didn't make it in there uh, but don't attribute to kind of um, malice what could be attributed to incompetence also so <laughs> somewhere somewhere in there is light lays the truth <laughs> But does it argue a consciousness of guilt on some of the higher ups or the people who were beginning to think we need to to uh, limit this? It's oh well, it's certainly there was uh, there was some damage control, uh, and that was the main reason to to put this the the uh, transcript on this classified server. Which is funny because you know within like six weeks or four to six weeks, the president had taken this what was considered to be like the most sensitive information. Put on the most classified of, of like you know uh, computer infrastructure and then release it to the public. Uh, I don't know. The president it was his own worst enemy. Oftentimes, that was uh, his way of declassifying things. I guess. Yeah. I have to say, as a, a student of history, and you and I talked about a bit of different history before we went on. I couldn't help but think of another Jewish army officer who was framed and kicked out of the military as a scapegoat for a larger scheme and that was was Alfred Dreyfus and you were made a scapegoat sometimes in the most absurd fashion um, when people talked about you being a, a spy for for Russia or for Ukraine when you came here at age three and and John you of course who everyone knows from the Bush administration uh, made made that possible suggestion as you were being assaulted with these attacks and slings and arrows were, were you feeling um how cartoonish this was all what this all was but how seriously people took it you know it's interesting i'm i'm uh, certainly uh, familiar with the dreyfus affair 
and I'd never, I don't know if I would equate myself to quite the kind of the disdain um, and the, the, the consequences that the Alfred Dreyfus faced, but there are some interesting parallels. And I think in his case, he was a, a, he was a uh, you know, useful scapegoat as, as um, both Jewish and um, German, and um, are, you know, useful to, to kind of uh, implicate in, in uh, treason and uh, dual uh, allegiance and so forth. In my case, I don't think my own uh, home organization ever kind of felt that way or uh, seemed to imply that way. What they did is it, it was in certain ways not quite as bad, but maybe even worse. They just remained silent when I was under attack, knowing I was an officer in good standing. Uh, you know, decades of service, including at the most senior echelons. You know, not somebody in the backwater, not like you know uh, uh, Dreyfus that was was established, but not like you know uh, uh, kind of central. Uh, I I did some pretty unique and you know i had the, the just the distinct honor of doing some pretty amazing unique things for the department of defense and um when i was under attack uh and unable to defend myself because i i, I had their pro prohibitions on doing so as a, a military officer uh th they just kind of left me uh, out there by myself and then at the conversely the president had uh, the president and his, his his press team had set out attack points Two right-wing media that then kind of reverberated for the you know for the duration that my name was cycling in the press about dual allegiances, uh, you know, um, uh, questions about my competency, leaker, leaker, and all that stuff. But it came straight from the White House, and the reason that we know this for a fact is because at one point uh, when they sent out these at these attack points, they didn't they did it in the most ham-handed manner. And they hit send, and it went to you know not a, it went to people on the address line that were not right wing media, so it, it was floating around there. So it was easy to kind of identify where this was coming from. Do you think that's maybe why your the the mil military didn't close ranks around you and support you is because this was coming from the commander in chief, and he was after all the commander in chief. Absolutely, there's no question in my mind that that was the case. But. Where's the exercise of judgment about following illegal orders and uh, allowing things to get out of hand as, as they did beyond the scope of a commander in chief's performance into sheer politics and game playing? Yeah, well, so this is a, a, an issue that I've been wrestling with because I do uh, so love my time in service and uh, recognize all the benefits I, I had for my military service. Um, I could frankly ta accept being sacrificed as kind of a pawn by the military, uh, where you know we we frankly come understand that there are, ca are casualties in war, at least in combat, uh, and that you know sometimes uh, things need to happen to kind of uh, achieve the military objectives, the national objectives. And if they were, if that were my conclusion, I could live with it, but I can't live with a military leadership uh, that does not embrace or represent the values of the institution and only acts only acted uh, to preserve their position, preserve their access, preserve their ability to you know uh, continue to advance and profit after the uh, after military career. And I don't know um, I don't I can't say definitively you know where these these uh, folks ended up in their decision making. I'm sure they rationalized it was you know a small sacrifice for the good of the institution, but I I, I am afraid that it might have been the other uh, the other motivation also. Um, you mentioned the Watergate hearings, and I think anybody who tuned in to hear your testimony and the testimony of of others surrounding this incident with the phone call and Zelensky. Um, was reminded of Watergate and was reminded of John Dean. And as you said, when, as you wrote, when you sat there, the openly hostile partisan tone of what happened and the Republican members whose goal was, as you said, to defend the president at all costs. Truth was their enemy. So my conveying the truth made me their enemy too. Did you feel like John Dean sitting up there about how much was at stake 
because of what it is that you and some of your colleagues were brave enough to say? Well, there's no question. I mean, I, I absolutely did not miss the, the gravity of the moment. I think that that scene where I walk into my twin brother's office, or even uh, right after the phone call, you know, tell him if the, if what I, I'm about to tell you ever becomes public, the president would be impeached, illustrates the fact that I, I understood the gravity immediately. Um, so I think much like John Dean, I, I recognized it. What I maybe didn't recognize uh, is that, you know, for a lot of folks that swear an oath to the constitution and hold uh, elected office, some of these things are just the words on a page rather than kind of uh, a, um, you know, a, a, a compass uh, to, uh, to, to be able to follow for, for, uh, for ways to behave, the ways to live your life, ways to kind of serve in office. And that's probably the biggest disconnect is, you know, I still had some misconceptions about the fact that I might be treated a little bit more kindly uh, because I was an arm, active duty army, army officer, you know, with, with decades of service. But we see even now that these same individuals don't have a bottom, don't have a, a you know, kind of a, a limit to how far they're willing to compromise. They've, they attack the, the police officers that they so, so kind of uh, tout support for on January 6th. So I think to me, you know, obviously a lot for a lot of these folks, it's words on a page rather than something meaningful. You write a lot in your book about your family background, about those awful Vinman boys racketing around the neighborhood. Don't grow up to be like those Vinman boys, you and your brother. Your father came here as a widower with your grandmother and your two brothers um, and, and made his place in this country with you know, fewer than $1,000 in his pocket, not being able to speak the language. And so there was a part of that, of your story that kind of puzzled and surprised me when you wrote about your father as a bellwether for the American public. And here's why, because your father who escaped the Soviet system thought the highest levels of the US government could resemble the Soviet system and you standing up to it, he thought there would be reprisal, you know, character assassination, career ending actions. And in essence, he thought the worst was possible of democracy. And yet the man he admired, Donald Trump, was the man who was epitomizing the worst of that and attacking you. So I, I was a little puzzled, but as you write, he changed his mind over time. He did. And I think there are cer certain things that you could accept and understand intellectually. Uh, but uh, at the same time, when it comes to your, your children, you feel viscerally. So he felt kind of a, a fear over what could happen to me. And he was in part right, you know, with regards to my military career, not with regards to kind of like, you know, par uh, uh, you know, immediate or personal peril. So um, I think it's that and is actually his understanding of power based on uh, a, a life uh, a long lived and, and experience and understanding how power is wielded in places that don't have the kinds of, um, you know, that uh, the rule of law is less important. He he was concerned about how power could be wielded against me. So he's a savvy guy. He's, uh, you know, he, he started out in a place where uh, as, a, as a refugee from communism, uh, he, the, he swung to the other side, to the kind of the, the, the unhealthy conservative spectrum. Uh, as a complete and utter rejection of the left. And that's where that's where he started. But I think, you know, in terms of his motivations, to me, it was clearly about my my well-being and his read on power, his read on how things work. Uh, and I'm 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 very fortunate to have his counsel actually. Uh, because he one of his concerns was was that you were helping the Democrats. Your perception is that you were helping democracy. His concern was that you were helping the Democrats. I don't know if I mean maybe early on that was a calculation because he, if he found it hard to believe that the president was the corrupt actor that, you know, frankly, he should have known better because, you know, New York, uh, uh, Trump is a New York figure with a, with a storied history of kind of corruption and failure and, and all sorts of negative, negative things. But um, I don't know. I think he, he also thought that, uh, maybe this is an individual could, that could shake, shake things up. The good thing is that my my mom put her foot down and you know basically said no more Fox Fox <laughs> News in the house and uh, you know limited uh, some of the Russian kind of propaganda that's that's uh, being financed by 
by uh, oligarchs from that part of the world that kind of have a, an anti anti left bent and and all sorts of other things that uh, are unfortunate that feed the immigrant community, um, the expat community, and uh, with with those blinders off, with me under attack and having faith and trust in me, his son, and uh, he he was able to to come around. There are moments in your narrative when things are packed together. For example, one day you receive notice that you're going to be testifying to Congress. And then the next day you get the call saying, congratulations, you're going to the US War College, which means a full colonelcy for you. And then following that several months later in 2020, Trump is acquitted two days later, the, uh, the head of HR, for the National Security Council essentially walks in and says, get away from the computer, um, you are dismissed. You're, it, the, the compactness of these events, the, the whiplash of these events must have been extraordinary for you. Yeah, I mean, that's true. Uh, I think, you know, in, in certain ways as an army officer, an infantryman, you know, it's a, like a react to contact drill. You know, you, you just, you, you're, in, you're in a, uh, something unforeseen happens and you just kind of like have to collect yourself very quickly, cool, calm, collected, respond. Um, I don't know. I, I, don't, I didn't find that some of these moments uh, juxtaposed each other to each other to be all that difficult to, to really face. It's the, 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 the far more challenging things, you know, more challenging than the initial report, um, more challenging than the much more difficult decision about giving forthright, you know, uh, un, un kind of restrained testimony that I knew was going to certainly get me fired from the White House and potentially was going to, you know, really kind of impact my military career would be the consequences of those actions and figuring out what I want to do with the rest of my life, uh, recognizing that my military career was coming to an end. A military career that was really quite fascinating and, you know, brought me from uh, combat in Iraq to the, the streets of Ma Moscow, uh, you know, advancing US national security interests while under the microscope of uh, the Russian security services to the Pentagon advising the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff as he's sitting across the, the table from, the, from you know, our, our most, most significant adversary in certain terms. I mean, just because they're the most aggressive in, in uh, 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 attacking US interests, the Russians. Uh, and, uh, you know, then the White House, that's the, the, the thing that uh, was most challenging, kind of moving on from that really fortunate career with all sorts of excellent opportunities that didn't just fall into my lap, I had to work really hard for, and then starting from scratch. Um, but I was not scared to do it either. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't self-deterred and just uh, thought about staying in. I, I knew that I could kind of figure it out and land on my feet, still figuring it out. There's your father's advice. Don't just start over. Keep starting over. Yes, yes, that's right. I think uh, he set the set an example for us by, you know, starting over a couple of times in the Soviet Union, come, uh, starting over here in the United States, and um, you know, it's part of these kind of ca catchphrases. Don't self deter. Uh, start over. Be prepared. Be prepared to start over. Keep starting over. Uh, all sorts of different things that kind of. Um, I was able to, to draw some conclusions about in writing this book. There's another book out called I Alone Can Fix It by the Washington Post reporters, Carol Lenning and Philip Rucker. And they talk to a lot of US military people, top military people, people who were in the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And General Milley said he was so shaken about Trump and the prospect of a coup that he and other top officials informally planned for different ways to stop Trump, according to this book. Um, resigning one by one rather than carrying out orders they, they consider to be illegal, dangerous, or ill-advised. Here's the military maybe acting the way you thought it might when confronted with earlier Trump trans transgressions. So how do you feel when you read that as a man who worked in those inner echelons? You know, it's interesting. I would say that, um, unfortunately, I'm in a position to take some of that with some skepticism. Um, I saw that saw them buckle in my case. I saw them kind of buckle with regards to this um, this notion of uh, you know participating in, in the suppression of a peaceful protest at Lafayette Park. Um, same thing with kind of a 
what seems to me, because I'm, I was out of the Pentagon uh, with a uh, slow response to an attack on the Capitol building with National Guard forces, and it seems unfortunately to me to be too convenient, convenient to have this come out, you know, uh, when when the chairman of the Joint Chiefs is is up for an extension of his two year uh, two year tenure to a four year tenure, uh, and um, when he's fallen short on other occasions, I mean, this is don't get me wrong; these are folks that uh, you know c spent decades in service, serving faithfully serving this nation. But I think in in my view, um, you know. The chairman, after these these missteps, I'm not sure if he gets the benefit of the doubt. Now, nor am I sure that he's still the best person for that job. I always uh, kind of uh, I was trained as a I, I was trained and I trained my subordinates to to do exercise something called out called a fallout drill. If you go down, your executive officer or one of the platoon leaders is prepared to stand up. There are other people that could do that job as effectively. I think it's hubris. I alone. Uh, you know, it's that I alone mentality that's keeping him in position right now. And it's the prospect of, of you know, I don't know. I, I, I guess I, at this point, I love the institution, but I, I've got my I've got some questions about how they operated under the Trump administration. And how could you not have some concerns and questions about uh, a um, leadership that, um, you know, has has not served this nation in certain regards? particularly well in 20 decades, I mean, in, in two decades, 20 years of, of war, uh, you know, not succeeding in the military mission or in the political or uh, achieving the political objectives. I think there's a, a, you know, a time for introspection. The time is now for introspection to figure out where we fell short and how we could do better. Before we get to some of our audience questions, I want to ask you about your area of expertise for all of these years, and that's Russia. So, can you assess how U.S.-Russia relations stand right now? Here is a country that is fundamentally a second-rate power. It's only a nuclear power by happenstance of World War II and negotiations. And it's how a fundamentally weak country exercises such backdoor power and how the United States is recalibrating our relationship with Russia. So it's, it's I, would, I would suggest, Pat, that there's more, uh, there's more than the artifact of Soviet power. The artifact of Soviet power is, you know, the the veto uh, um, ability to veto in the U.S. Uh, in the U.N. Security Council. Uh, it's the you know the 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 size of the country. It's the nuclear arsenal. There's more to it than that. In the 20 years of uh, of uh, Putin rule, they have actually done a fair bit to recover from the times of trouble in the 90s. Um, they have. A foundation. It's it's a relatively weak foundation, um, uh, based on kind of petrol dollars, uh, oil and gas, uh, and they've rebuilt the military into to a relatively potent force that sometimes is kind of underestimated based on the fact that their GDP in U.S. dollars is a fraction of ours. But in um, uh, purchasing power parity, they actually spend a huge amount of money on the military and the security apparatus, an enormous amount, and therefore they could actually it regionally caused a, he a heck of a lot of headaches for us. They did that uh, in Syria. They're, you know, certainly they're, uh, they're all over Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine. Um, they have the ability to kind of cause, cause havoc in like, even in the Western hemisphere by providing support to the Venezuelans and so forth. So there, I wouldn't dis dis dismiss them entirely, but you're absolutely right. The very foundation of power is economic power and they're a fraction of the US. But they're willing to use that that limited economic power in a way that's uh, highly destructive to the international system, and that sets an example to other countries that they could upend the the international system to serve their interests. And, and the Hungries, the Turkeys, and most most dangerously, the Chinese are found, looking at the way the Russians have challenged the system without cost. And they're looking at doing do, they're doing the same exact thing, and that's why Russia is, is is so dangerous. With cyber warfare, which is hard to counter in kind or even to ferret out. Exactly. Well, that's definitely one of the areas. But what about freedom of uh, the way they they've kind of undermined freedom of navigation, setting the template for the Chinese to do the same thing in East and South China seas, excessive claims in uh, in the, the the high north. 
uh, what was a peaceful kind of area of, uh, along the North Sea route, uh, militarizing. They're all they're doing all sorts of things to kind of uh, upend, um, you know, a norms based system. And again, other countries, other regional powers, and other great powers are taking note and uh, adopting some of those things. And we could see that play out in the cyber domain and in, in a bunch of different information domain, particularly dangerous in the information domain. I don't think Russia's ever given up being sore over retreating from California 170 years ago. That's right. They still have a monument. Uh, I forgot what the name of that place yeah, is. Uh, Fort Ross. Yeah, Fort Ross. That's right. Well, uh, I don't think they're coming back. At least <laughs> we should be uh, aware of what it is that they they would like to do here. Let's uh, let's get some questions um, from some of our watchers here tonight. Um, Jerry, a lot of people ask, Jerry asks, are you still getting hate mail? The, the larger question is like how secure you feel, how your life is going. I know you note in the book that all the, the actual letters that you got by the hundreds and hundreds, all but a few, were very positive and supportive. And uh, that's really what, what I, you know, I, that's really what my mind goes to is my interactions, my interpersonal interactions with people on the street with people that reach out to me directly, with the mail that I received from thousands of folks, uh, has been very overwhelmingly positive. The negative attacks have come from like the you know, uh, almost as a badge of honor from like the the Fox Newses and the OANN and these far right fringe networks that uh, really can't. Ha they're not they're not news. They're they're you know entertainment, but really mainly they're kind of um, they're their shock jocks of the, of the modern age. And then from the social media uh, uh, landscape, where again, uh, you know, as my daughter's favorite artist uh, says, you say it in the street, it's a knockout. You say it in the tweet, it's a cop out. So how could you not dismiss that? That's Taylor Swift, by the way. Let, let me give her credit. <laughs> um, so you, you feel personally better about the position you're in, you're less vulnerable um, perhaps than you felt earlier. I think that's true. Uh, I, I also try to maintain good situational awareness uh, and uh, alert to uh, you know what, what's going on around me. My my wife is really insisting that we change the venue and leave the, the kind of the Northern Virginia DC bubble and maybe move to someplace friendly like uh, Southern California, where we, <laughs> we, we feel a, a lot of support, or, or Southern Florida. Um, not not an entire not central or northern Florida by the way just southern Florida. But not anyway, near Mar-a-Lago. No, I mean there's that little pocket around Mar-a-Lago, but whatever. Um, it's probably going to go bankrupt soon enough. Um, <laughs> so I mean there there is it's not something that should be uh, outright dismissed, but there were points in time where I you know I I considered moving us onto a base because of the 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 threats and uh, you know how we might be accessible. Instead, we increased police patrols and things of that nature. But that was um, that was precautionary based on mail and, and kind of vitriol. Um, there's a bigger question about where we are now, uh, you know, in terms of like you know uh, moving on from the military, moving on from this episode. But well, you're getting that's... you're getting a PhD at Johns Hopkins and right. working for a think tank. Is that right? Yeah, I'm working. Um, so I'm a, the Pritzker Military Fellow um, at um, the Lawfare Institute. I'm at Johns Hopkins uh, as uh, as a um, uh, a doctoral candidate. Uh, I'm affiliated with the University of Pennsylvania as a vid visiting fellow and also at the Foreign Policy Institute, Institute at Johns Hopkins. I'm doing some consulting and, uh, oh, on the board of a non-governmental organization that's really keen on uh, trying to, to figure out some solutions to the ills befalling in this country. It's the Renewed Democracy Initiative that was founded by uh, Gary Kasparov. Um Harold would like to know, and this is a question I think that's occupied many just casual observers. What do you think was discussed in private with no American note taker between Trump and Putin in Helsinki? Uh, I think that there was probably, there was, I mean, that was my very first day on the job, by the way, oh. on the National Security Council. Welcome. So was, <laughs> yeah, well, welcome. I, I was supposed to there show up there, get my computer accounts, get that kind of orientations and all that kind of stuff. I think I made it through the first two before the news, the press conference came on. But, um, you know, I, I, uh, I'm not overly alarmed by that. Uh, there were a large number of conversations between 
uh, Putin and Trump and all, you know, just about all of them were monitored. Even in this case, there was a, 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 a State Department official that was translating that, you know, would, wouldn't par uh, be party to something that was Ill illegal or undermined, um, you know, the, the, the security of the, of the United States. Uh, I think it was basically the president, uh, President Putin wrapping President Trump with his kind of, uh, with his tirade on, you know, uh, how America has been mistreating Russia and that, you know, he had nothing to do with uh, the election interference in 2016 and how good looking Tr Donald Trump is and how wealthy and how successful he is pandering to him, basically like a, uh, the case officer that Putin was, a KGB case officer, you know, uh, uh, pandering to, to Donald Trump to, to, to really get the most optimal outcome out of him, which was to get the president, to get President Trump to attack his own, you know, intelligence apparatus, uh, you know, and saying that he, he believed Trump, uh, uh, you know, he believed Putin over the intel community. So he, he did what he, I think what we, we saw was the result of that conversation. Um, there was nothing, you know, Putin didn't really have to work that hard with Trump. Trump was, you know, I, I was a useful idiot and gave Putin a lot of what he needed. And that term supposedly dates back to Lenin, doesn't it? Useful idiot. Well, it, it's a it's a term of art, certainly in the kind of the uh, in the um, human intelligence community about how how you kind of develop sources. But it, yes, it, uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I guess that's not. I'm not familiar with its use under Lenin, but it's a it's a term used uh, very frequently in, in in intel circles to describe uh, how how agents um, operate, um, how officers operate agents and so forth. Um, you spent a lot of time in the book talking about what happened to your military career and how it got stymied. And the, the, the effort was not to, to get rid of you entirely to make you a martyr, but to make you unhappy, to sideline you, to marginalize you, which, um, you saw was happening, but David wants to know um, about your brother's career, your twin brother, and what yeah. has become of him. He's he's an active duty army officer, um, and you know I, I I I'm pretty careful about what I uh, say about his career his his career. He was promoted to to uh, full bird colonel recently, but what I can say is, in spite of that, he is stigmatized much like I am or I was, and um, even in the course of his promotion, uh, uh, you know, basically senior officers that presided the, uh, uh, at the promotion backed out and they said it was because of, you know, my participation or whatever the case might be. I think he's, um, he's, he's in a precarious situation also. Does the fact that there's a change in administration help to protect him, or is this all about what's going on within the military itself, no matter who the commander in chief is? That's exactly right. It's it's internal, and I would say that uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, one of the, one of the um, for an administration that's been highly active on advancing, uh, you know, uh, policy interests that help m many Americans, I think where they fall they've fallen short on um, is on accountability. And to kind of just uh, um, investigate the wrongdoings of the previous administration, not so that they could seek ret retribution against those officials, unless there was something criminal, but mainly to kind of uh, illuminate where the risks are and and harden this country. Uh, so I think that's where, where. So they're not they're not looking at these things. They're not looking at you know. Uh, and not, nor do we have an expectation of that happening, but they're not looking at you know our situation or anything of that nature. They moved on to to uh, the business of government uh, and and think that you know this country could just heal. But I see it as an open wound that uh, some of these things that need, haven't been addressed need to be addressed before we we could really come together. Uh, and and that goes to a question Linda wants to know about the Justice Department pursuing some of these bad actors from the previous administration and maybe even the military calling some of its members to account for what they did or more specifically didn't do? Uh, I think, I mean, uh, certainly it's something that I'm uh, dead set on. I, in my conversation with Governor Schwarzenegger yesterday, uh, I, I kind of see it as two sides of, of, of a coin. 
he was laser focused on unity and bringing this country together and, um, you know, and casting a, a, a very positive and justifiably positive view of this country's future over the long run. Uh, I agree with him and I still re remain uh, optimistic uh, and I think this is a country where right matters, but I think it only matters if we make right matter here. And to me, making right matter me includes uh, accountability and dealing with these issues, these unresolved issues that have weakened this, this nation. Uh, so I, I wanna see both. I think, you know, uh, I'm happy to talk, uh, expound ad nauseum about how this country is different and why matter, uh, why right matters here. This is a wonderful country, but I think we also need uh, need some. Uh, we need to shake off some complacency and make right matter here. Um, the the answer to this may be hell no, but Doug wants to know whether there's a position in the Biden administration that might interest you. You know they haven't asked, and I'm not looking for anything. Uh, I've, I've I've committed to um, my doctoral studies. Do I, would I rule out uh, government service as, at some point? If I think I could help um, ad, uh, advance uh, US national security, I'd say no, uh, I would not dism dismiss it um, if, I have the, if, if I think I could be helpful, but uh, I'm not looking for that. They haven't asked and I think you know, we're, we're okay with where we are. Uh, in the book, you refer to the military as a conservative institution, meaning it moves very slowly and deliberately, but there are a lot of questions from people who are watching about it as a politically conservative institution. Gary, for example, says, I have multiple relatives in the military, all of them Trump supporters. So what do you say about your experiences with the commander in chief and, and when it is that some individual judgment has to come into play? So I think that it, it, I, you, you couched it the way I, I tend to think of it. It's, it's, it's in a conservative institution slow to change, comfortable in the way things are. Um, politically, uh, you know, we, we, we espouse and adhere to um, a doctrine of remaining apolitical and that's right. But sometimes that, and, and at least in my case, that uh, apoliticism or desire to, to remain apolitical was inherently political in its own actions uh, in, in, in their inaction rather. Uh, and I think, Yes, the military tends to run slightly more conservative, but my experience and the polling suggests that under the Trump administration, that shifted and that the President, President Trump lost an enormous amount of ground, uh, primarily because he didn't exemplify the values of the military. He's not like a, Jane, a John Wayne type figure, you know, with, with a swagger and uh, with a kind of a cool confidence, could be taken at his word. He was none of those things. He was a weak, egotistical, narcissistic man, and I think that you know a, a lot of people, uh, 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 a lot of people recognize that, and he lost that support because he didn't ex exemplify, you know, what it means to be an, a, a, a kind of like a, you know, a, an, an American man. Um, you were at the fulcrum of sort of the worst and maybe the best of American politics and the American character. How has your thinking changed about? the country, its ambition versus its realities. Where, where do you think we're, we're heading? Are you optimistic about it with the Trump administration gone or is the residue still poisoning us? The residue is poisoning us. Uh, and I think that there is a wishful thinking uh, that things have returned back to normal, we're safe again. And there's a, a, a complacency uh, associated with that. And that's why I, you know, I've taken this, my catchphrase, I have a catchphrase, that's crazy. Uh, and change, adjusted it to making, you know, to, to this idea of making right matter if we want it to matter. But at the same time, I do recognize that this is a wonderful country and that our challenges that we face today are part, part of the, the narrative sweep of America throughout its history, where we've been faced with enormous challenges and we've slowly marched on, improved, faced on, down those challenges, moved towards this, uh, this idea of a more perfect union uh, a work in progress that continues to, to, to advance with the occasional setbacks, but continues to advance. And um, sometimes we overlook how good we really have it here. And we fall victim to you know, the, the media sensationalizing the difficulties. But I would encourage people to look around them. 
look at their local communities and see what's really reflected in their communities. There are fundamental issues that need to, to be addressed. I know in this, in this town in particular, there's a, a homeless crisis that needs to be addressed. But at the same time, I think this country is, you know, is, is prosperous. There are unlimited opportunities here. And it is not the utter disaster being portrayed by Fox News, where there are riots in the streets. You know, it's a bloodbath that just doesn't exist. That's, you know, it's always some other place that's like that, not, not where you live, because it's not reflective of, of what you're experiencing. Uh, and I just want, I, I would urge that we kind of look th at things in context and look at reality as opposed to, you know, the, these, uh, these messages. My catchphrase is that I worry that while we are still a powerful country beyond question, we may no longer be a serious one when you look at anti-vaxxers and some of the racist right-wing protests that are going on. Um, that suggests a mid-course correction is more than overdue. And how do we accomplish that? How do we put that ideal of ourselves out, out front again? I agree with that. I think there's a couple things. Uh, first of all, um, I would encourage this administration to take stronger leadership on the issues that fundamentally divide us, whether that's COVID, the big lie of stolen elections, that, that those things shouldn't be tolerated and should be shouted down from the bully pulpit. Uh, and that's a powerful, powerful instrument, 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 the bully pulpit. But in addition to that, we share a lot of the same ills with our closest allies, other democracies, that, are, that have internal vulnerabilities and are uh, threatened externally by, by the rise of authoritarianism. And I think one of the things that we can do is, is a concept that this, uh, this administration's kind of uh, picked up, which is uniting uh, democracies, values based on uh, democratic values and principles and bringing those to, uh, together to, to solve common shared problems. So I think it's, a, it's um, you know, at least a two-step solution that I've articulated course, it's much more complex than that. But I've I wrote a piece about this uh, back in um, in December in Foreign Affairs. Uh, also on Russia, I've written a, a lot. So if people are interested, they could uh, take a look at some of those articles. More than one of our viewers has suggested and asked, and maybe we'll let you wrap up with this. Would you ever run for office? You know, I've, I, I've been asked this question increasingly frequently, and I tried to, to, to answer this uh, to not be disingenuous and not say something like I'll never run, uh, be, but I ha currently have no uh, aspirations to run. It's something that I, I guess I'm thinking about as a way to continue to serve and do good. And uh, in a way, there's been a renaissance around this idea of service, at least elected office, because I've connected and had uh, uh, I've got uh, developing relationships with some very, very honorable public servants that really uh, believe that they could do some good and um, you know, take their oaths of office seriously. I don't know. Uh, I don't think I would be able to convince my wife to do, to to uh, you know <laughs> to step into the sphere. But it's possible that there's you know. I don't know. Well, we will leave it at that. I want to remind you that my guest has been retired Lieutenant Colonel Alex Finman. His book is here. Right matters, an American story, and you have been hearing about that American story and what brought him to this moment at the fulcrum of history at a time when we needed it. I think everybody would say in a context meaning something the same and something different. Thank you for your service from me. Spasiva Bolshoi. Spasiva Bolshoi. We want to remind you of our upcoming program, August 18th, cyber journalist Shira Frankel, UCLA constitutional law and tech professor Eugene Volokh are going to be talking with Larry Mantle and how social media is affecting American politics. You can look at your screen right there and see the issues coming up. You can also find out more about how to support programs like this that happen every week here with America at a crossroads, as you've just heard from our guest, Alex Binman. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope to see you here virtually next week. Thanks again. <laughs>